Good, how are you? Uh, I'm good. I'm really excited to be done with school. Yeah, congrats on your master's. Yeah, thanks. Um, I was really glad for that whole process to be over. It was a very stressful last phase to do the interview stuff on Friday. Oh, yeah. Um, how does it feel to be done with AP tests? Pretty good. Yeah. I don't have to worry about anything else for a while. Yeah, I uh, just got to worry about, I don't know, uh, getting ready for UC Zoom in the fall. Yeah. Have Have your schools emailed you guys yet about that? Um, they haven't said anything about, like, if we're starting online, but it's probably going to happen since Cal States are doing online. So I'm, yep. we're, I'm expecting, like, an email soon. Yeah, that's why I was asking, because I figured it had to come soon with uh, – I got the email from Cal State LA like the day before my interview. Yeah. Um, I think private schools are still open in the fall. Uh, yeah, we'll see. I mean, nobody wants to be hit with a lawsuit. And if like one of those places proves to be an epicenter, they would probably get hit with a lawsuit. Mm -hmm. So far, um, Pepperdine still says we're going to have in-person classes in the fall. What? Yeah, we'll see. I mean, if they can like accommodate enough space for everybody, that makes sense. One of the homies who I'm graduating with is going to Princeton for his physics PhD in the fall. And for Princeton, uh, they're not allowing undergraduates back on campus. They're only allowing graduates. Um, because the graduates need to be in the laboratories doing research because that's the actual important work that is done at a college for the most part. And uh, graduates are only like three or 4% of the campus population. So it should be okay to have only the PhD students on campus. Um, anyway, today we're going to do some chemistry instead of physics. Today we'll be talking about making good coffee. Um, and I'll be going over uh, four different methods. I'll be showing two different methods. Uh, and at any time, just like hit me with a quick pause uh, if you have a question or want uh, graduation present shopping advice in case people are like oh what do you want for graduation you could be like oh i want this expensive coffee equipment like why not right you earned it no one's gonna um, remember us graduating um just you, you know use it to pull that sympathy and ask for really nice graduation gifts yeah um but yeah, no, I mean, I'm graduating class of 2020. Yeah, I know the bad feeling. Um, Hello. I mean, for the most part, I don't care. For the most part, I just want them to mail me my diploma. And then I like already went on my resume and then I changed the master's degree from in progress to completed or whatever, which was the important part. Um, but yeah, not having a graduation ceremony is a real bummer for my homies who like cared or whatever. Um, like the people whose families live in town so they can come observe. Yeah, that's like gotta be rough. Um, it's okay though, y'all are a bright group. You'll still have, you know, a, a bachelor's graduation to have fun with in four years um, or five years in case y'all go into engineering. Uh, anyway, uh, let me talk a little bit about ouch. what we're doing aside from this. Uh, no, that's not even an ouch. Like that's not saying that like you won't graduate on time if you go into engineering. Uh, but most engineering programs are planned to be five years, five years, five years. So no if you go to UCLA Cal School of Engineering, engineering. if you go to UCLA you go to School UCLA of Engineering School and you graduate on time, that's a five-year plan. Five plan. The one at Cal Poly, they say it's uh, average four years. But if you look at it, like if you go on r slash Cal Poly Pomona, everyone that's like been engineer says five years. Yeah, yeah, it's almost always that way for engineering degrees. So it's probably four years if you also like do their summer plan that they have set out for you. But if you not like want to chill in the summers, then it'll be five. I know someone that did electrical engineering at Cal Poly and finished in three years. They graduated. How? This year. I don't know. Uh, That's what probably I'm doing. doing community college while they were in high school to get some stuff out of the way, plus a lot of AP tests, plus summers. Oh. Mr. Rob, uh, um, I was going to do thing like GCC classes over summer before I go to Cal Poly. And they told us if we do that, like we're going to be counted as transfer students instead of incoming freshmen. 
so we can't do it now. Uh, why would it be a problem that you would be counted as a, oh yeah, that is actually a common issue with um, taking classes the summer before. Usually they want you to start and finish a degree on campus. I wanted to take two more classes so I'd have six Gs out of the way. Uh, I don't know, hit up, ask both the counselor at GCC and the counselor at Cal Poly to see if either one of them can fix the problem for you. Um, okay. Or do a power move and email, but put both of them in the send line so that they both see that the other person received the question. That might create mm -hmm. a little bit of competition for each one of them to get the job done. Uh, okay. Anyway, uh, today we're going to talk about coffee. I'm going to do some tutorials and demonstrations. Um, sadly, the whole point of this is for y'all to like get to smell and taste these coffees, but you know, that technology sadly hasn't been invented yet. Um, so this is as close as we're going to get as long as we're living in COVID world. Uh, like I said, if you have any questions as we go along, just ask. And just so you know, uh, we will be convening for class every day for the rest of the week because um, this is technically the last week of school for seniors. Uh, what we're going to do after today is I'll be back upstairs in my normal broadcasting area and I'll be doing the lectures for mechanical waves and sound. Uh, I'll do some demonstrations, so be sure to have headphones because um, I'm going to be running some sound wave uh, generating software through Zoom to show you guys some of the limits of human hearing, all that good stuff. Uh, and then I'll also be doing the demonstration this week where I measure the speed of sound using a tube and a bucket. And I'll be talking about it just because it's good like physics knowledge for your brain, uh, especially all of y'all uh, incoming college freshmen. Almost everybody has to take uh, incoming freshman physics. And it is the cause for a lot of people to change majors away from science. Uh, that was even like the case with my wife or whatever. Um, no shame, but the, the best way to be prepared for the shock of incoming freshman physics is to, you know, have a strong foundation. And uh, waves are a place in freshman physics where things can get really sticky. Uh, of course, if that ever happens, you know, shoot me an email. Um, but anyway, today we're going to talk about some different ways that you can make coffee. Uh, better ways that you can make coffee, like science-based methods for the preparation of high-quality coffee. Uh, and we're going to start off first with cold brew, just because that's the one that takes the longest to prepare. Um, so when it comes to cold brew, there are a lot of different options for the product that I'm about to show you guys. Um, what I use is called the Hario Mizu Dashi. It's a Japanese product where Mizu means water and Dashi means method. Oh, I'm sorry, other way around. Dashi means water, Mizu. No, I had it right the first time, yeah. Mizu means water, Dashi means method. Uh, it just means water method. So it's this picture here that looks like this. Um, and interesting thing about it is it's not just for coffee. You can also make a couple other things with it. You could put tea inside the basket and make like a long steep cold brew tea. There's also a type of uh, really common Japanese uh, broth that you use for cooking. But the thing that prepares the broth is actually seaweed. So you take that special kind of roasted seaweed, put it in here, and then let it steep in water overnight in order to make a cold brewed version of that broth. Uh, it's actually a really useful piece of hardware, um, very versatile. Uh, I actually have two of them uh, because when it comes to cold brew, this is going to make about one liter of water. Um, and just so that you have like some of the numbers or whatever that I use, uh, I use 120 grams of coffee medium ground uh, with 1,000 grams of water. And since the density of water is exactly one milliliter per gram, uh, one kilogram of water is the same as one liter of water. Um, and the reason why I have two of these guys is the fact that it takes 24 to 36 hours to brew this. Um, so usually I have two of these pots in alternation. And uh, I make one of them a day, and then after I make this one on camera that I'm about to make in front of you guys, uh, it'll basically go into like my fermentation station, my like little corner where I leave it at room temperature while it brews. And then after being left outside for one day, then I move it to the fridge overnight so that it can be cool for consumption. Um, have you guys had cold brew? Yep. Wait, Michelle, yes. Can you leave it out first and then it's the sweeter than like. Black coffee. Uh, it's more bitter. I had a lot of stuff going on there. So um, 
No, cold brew is not more bitter. So cold brew is a has a very, very mellow flavor. Um, if you've had a cold coffee drink and it was bitter, I would bet that it was coffee that was made hot and then cooled down. Um, the coffee that, that is, I have every morning is uh, it's triple dark nitro cold brew. Um, triple dark. So it's made from a dark roast? Yeah. That's probably why, yeah, any dark roast is going to taste bitter because you're just consuming burned material. I mean, that's what dark True. roast is. It is it is more burn, um, which is why last week at the end of the week, I mentioned that uh, you want to go for a light roast or a medium roast, and you want to go with a burr grinder. Uh, the, the quality of your coffee in the end is like a chain. It's only as good as its weakest link. So any skipping of steps is going to produce like a sub uh par product that you won't want to consume anyway um but yeah so today i'll be uh, burning up 120 grams of ah uh medium ground light roast coffee beans and then adding to that a kilogram of water and then i'm going to leave it out for 24 to 36 hours so uh fair warning loud noises um i'm about to run my grinder and uh like i said good local coffee this is Sumatra um, Mandalang from Jones Coffee Roaster in Pasadena. Uh, really good stuff, and and they have delivery. Uh, Robinson? Uh, I have a question. Yes? Um, one time when I made cold brew, um, the recipe that I followed only said like 12 hours, and then when I drank it, it was very like watered down. So yeah. I like yeah, yeah, that's garbage. So, um, uh, yeah, 24 to 36 hours. 24 hours is nonsense. Restaurants all do 24 to 36 hours or more. Mm -hmm. um, especially since the more concentrated it is, the less of it you have to use. And I'll actually show you guys when I make a drink in a second. Anyway, this is my burr grinder. Loud noises. Oh, right. For electronics to work, they need to be plugged in, yeah? Uh, anyway, uh, loud noises. bring over my food scale, which, uh, by the way, food scales are great. Um, food scales are super important for like baking. So if I were you, I would have one anyway, uh, just because, yeah, uh, just because there's a big difference between like one cup of tightly packed flour and one cup of loosely packed flour, but there's no ambiguity when a recipe calls for 500 grams of flour. Uh, I don't know, having a food scale is just a nice sciencey thing. Also, the main reason why I use one of these for when I prepare coffee isn't because I'm afraid of using too little. Uh, I actually use it to make sure that I don't use too much coffee um, because it's really easy to like go overboard and be wasting coffee, especially when there's like no need to. Uh, what with the cost of coffee being what it is. Anyway, just like knocking coffee out of my uh, grinder into the cold brew pot. The grinder ran out, so I actually think I might need to refill it and run it one more time to get to Making coffee in this cramped setup is uh, super weird. 
Um, I'm like so afraid I'm just going to spill coffee all over my laptop, which would be a big sad. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, so we got this guy filled up with coffee grounds. I did spill a little, which is a terrible, terrible waste. Um, and then you take a, a chopstick. Okay, yeah, this kind of thing kind of work. Uh, so now it's like pop out the coffee grounds, right? So I take the, the, the chopstick all the way down to the bottom uh, and then soak the coffee in the water, right? And it's really important to be careful. Times at the bottom, it's like weird little scare coffee holes are, and the coffee won't actually soak all the way through through everything. So I make sure to get all of the coffee wet, uh, puncture some holes down into the bottom where there are little air pockets to make sure all of the coffee gets saturated. And you can kind of tell that all of it has been saturated because it suddenly gets hard to stir, kind of like concrete. Uh, rinse off the chopstick just so that there's no waste. And then this takes about 20 to 30 minutes to fill. Um, normally, I like clear the whole sink out first and then get this set up on like a slow drip. I think attachments for your sink or whatever that will like guarantee a measurable slow drip for you. Uh, but I find I can get there just by fiddling with the settings a bit. Uh, yeah, I mean, just let that uh, slow drip at that speed for about 30 minutes until the bottom is full. You'll also notice that, like, at the start, the darkness of the coffee coming out is not very dark. But now that it's on a slow drip, even the, like, first little bits of coffee are already a nice dark brown. But it gets way darker over the next few days. Uh, but, yeah, you just leave that on slow drip. Uh, the slower, the better. Like, the slower, the more flavorful. Uh, just because it's not letting the coffee become unnecessarily dilute. It makes it so that every single drop of water has to travel all the way through the entire cylinder of ground coffee. Um, is that okay? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So big fan of cold brew. It's delicious. It's easy. Uh, you have to wait, but that's why, I, like I said, I have two pots. Uh, so let me show you like drink preparation for once this is done. So um, just like a cooking show, <laughs> I prepared some in advance. Um, and so this is the stuff that I prepared in advance. You see like how dark it is. This is uh, two days old. I already had some of the breakfast, so this is the last breakfast left for today. Um, and with this, it's actually so strong, you don't want to have it alone. So to make a good uh, cold brew with it, in my opinion, the ice isn't um, optional, it's actually mandatory, because you do want it to be diluted down just a little bit, just a tiny bit. Uh, so there's ice. Oh, is there a good ice sound effect to that? Was that audible? No. Uh, coffee. And uh, you want to take it and stir it, uh, not only to get the glass cold, because it'll like help get the glass cold, which will help say keep the drink cold longer. But the point here is also to intentionally dissolve in some of this ice, because like I said, it's too dark to drink. It's like a, a shot of espresso in in uh, a cold shot of espresso almost. Um, and then after that is kind of diluted down just a bit. Um, I don't know, man. I like half and half. Um, and it just has such a nice color to it. I don't know if, like, the, the hazy sky light back lighting does any justice. Oh, by the way, did it rain today where you guys live? Yeah. Yeah, it's so weird. Oh, yeah, it's wild. Nope, yeah, not for me. Yes. Really strange weather. Yeah. Um, oh, look, it's a boy cat. Hey, cat. Hey. He really doesn't like the, the camera tripod that I brought down here to set up. Um, but yeah, so that's coffee method one. That's cold brew. 
It's excellent. I highly recommend it. Uh, you could get crazy with it and get like a nitrogen set up and pressurize your cold brew. Uh, all sorts of weird stuff that you can do. Uh, but let me show you guys some of the... Um, no, that's a Minecraft wiki. Hold on. I'm on the wrong tabs. Okay. Uh, so in terms of cold brews, uh, if you just go on Amazon or whatever your shopping platform is that you prefer, uh, you can go on here and look at all the different products they have. So these guys that I have, these two, uh, they're only 20 bucks each. And one of them I found at Goodwill. Uh, and it was only $3 because they didn't know what it was. Um, so, uh, you know, just like keep an eye out there. And I recommend that if you're going to do cold brew stuff, you might want to get um, more than one of them. Just because with only one of them, you can't always have coffee. It's only enough to make coffee every other day. Uh, but yeah, they come in all sorts of different form factors and sizes. This fancy one is the Japanese one that I'm using. Um, but lots of different companies make them, though they all look basically the same. Uh, is that okay? Are there any questions out there about cold brew? Good? Mm -hmm. I'm just sorry I can't actually share it with you. Um, and uh, so yeah, that's method one, that's cold brew. Um, let me talk about some other ones that I'm not gonna be demonstrating today. So here's another really good one that I recommend if you are looking for a good cheap introductory kit. Uh, this is called an AeroPress. And I think the way that it works is pretty like self-explanatory. These are all the components that it comes with. Uh, it comes with the actual piston little disc paper filters that you use to put on the front of the uh, press itself to filter out the coffee grounds, a scoop, a funnel, and then that little flat stick is for stirring it. Um, you put the coffee and the hot water on the inside here and then put the piston in to hold it in place. You let it steep for a while and then after it's steeped, usually like two or three minutes, then you apply pressure on the piston to push it all the way through. It's basically a hand pressurized espresso maker so if you do a little bit of water and a lot of air, it comes out a little bit like espresso, but if you fill it all the way to the top with water, then it basically pumps out black coffee. Uh, this is a good one that's like nice and self-contained. It's easy to put away. This is a really good uh, college option. Um, the only reason why I'm not gonna demonstrate my AeroPress today is that it's downstairs in my bins of camping equipment because this is usually my car camping model. Um, just boil water on the campfire and everything else is ready to go over here with the AeroPress as long as you ground your coffee at home before you went camping. Um, big fan of the AeroPress. Uh, the other one that I wanna call out is too fancy to the point that I don't have it at home because I don't wanna invest $700 in a setup. Um, but this other method over here is called siphon coffee. And if you ever get a chance to uh, try it out in the wild, I would highly recommend it. Um, siphon coffee is one of the methods that they use at Demi Tasse in Little Tokyo. And what they do is they put a bulb of water down below, they heat that, and then the pressure from the water being heated down below pushes it upwards into a top chamber. In that top chamber, they then add the coffee grounds and stir it, right? Um, and then when the heat below is turned off, the drop in pressure from the bulb down below basically causes a vacuum effect. And then the coffee from the top is pulled back into the bottom through a filter and down below is where the uh, filtered coffee is collected. Um, really fancy method, makes a really interesting cup of coffee, uh, mostly because the pressure, the pressure that's being used to filter it is like the opposite of how an espresso machine works. Normally an espresso machine applies high pressure and forces the coffee through. This is actually forcing the coffee through using negative pressure. The pressure on the inside of the bulb is lower than the atmosphere, so it's being pressurized by the atmosphere itself. Uh, makes a good cup of coffee. Really weird. Um, like, have any of y'all out there been to Demi Tasse? No. Uh, if I was you, if you have a Yelp or whatever, I would like look it up and add it to your list. I think they're reopening soon, and it's uh, really good stuff once it's safe to go outside again. Uh, they have every method in case you want to go there and be like, oh, what does cold brew taste like? What does siphon taste like before you throw down on any of the equipment? Um, and now I'm going to show you guys the main way that I make coffee. So like um, the 
cold brew is seasonal. Like I mostly do that in the summer when it's too hot to drink hot coffee. And like, who wants to wake up when it's already 80 degrees outside and drink hot coffee, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But luckily today is one of those perfect rainy days where I just want to like turn on music and read a book outside. Um, So today is a perfect day for hot coffee. Usually when I'm making hot coffee at home, I make pour over hot coffee. Uh, And again, I have like a product that I use and prefer though any one of these cone-shaped objects will act as a perfectly fine pour-over coffee maker. I don't think there's any significant difference between any of these. The only thing you have to look out for is if the bottom comes to a perfect cone point, like this metal one right here, or if it comes to like a flat bottom wedge, they're both fine. They produce a very similar cup of coffee in my opinion. The only thing is that uh, that will tell you what kind of uh, filter you need to get. They take a different shape filter. Uh, I have two different pour overs myself. I have a Hario um, glass cone, this guy right here. Just a cone. And then on the bottom is a, uh, like a piece of rubber. And then this piece of rubber adapts it to this like olive wood ring that just holds it up on top of the cup. The other pour over cone that I have uh, is a Chemex, which is actually right there on the Amazon screen, that wooden one. this one is my Chemex. I have the restaurant version, so it's all glass. Exactly the same as the other pour over. It's just that this will make three or four cups at a time, whereas my regular glass cone is for like one cup just for myself. Um, and then when it comes to these uh, pour over cones, like I said, they come in a lot of different shapes, forms, even materials. This is a really uh, good cheap option. Again, if you want to just like get into making fancy coffee cheap, they also have these fun collapsible ones, which are for uh, camping. So it'll like you, it'll smush down all the way flat for storage. And then when you want to use it, you take it out and pop it up. Um, I think those things are nifty. Again, if you're thinking about like, oh, how do I save space in my tiny college kitchen? Um, But yeah, let me show you guys how to make a pour over to coffee. Um, So yeah, coffee brewing stuff I wanted to say. The numbers for cold brew, the numbers for pour over are up next. And then we already talked about AeroPress and Siphon. Just some interesting, like, quick side notes. So I want to make sure I said it. Okay. So when it comes to pour over, uh, the ratios that I use are uh, 32 grams of coffee. Again, a light roast from a bird grinder. And then 500 grams water uh, on the scale which is the same as 500 milliliters, because again, like the SI unit system was set up uh, to define the density of water as being one, so that it's easy to convert mass to volume uh, in case you don't have a food scale. And uh, the other thing that I think is really, really important about the temperature of the water is that um, it's the same rules as the price is right. A good cup of hot coffee, you wanna go as close as you can without going over up to 96 degrees Celsius. Any hotter than this with the water and you are scorching the coffee and ruining the flavor. Uh, Basically above that temperature, um, delicate organic compounds will just get converted to burnt material. The same way how like all material, if you take it, you light it on fire, the result is black uh, ash, right? Um, You are taking all of these diverse complex organic molecules and simplifying them down to more or less carbon, just carbon dioxide and various chunks of solid carbon, and you just get that burnt taste. Uh, Highly recommend that when you boil water for making coffee by hand, you wanna make sure that you come in underneath this number. Now there's a couple different ways to do it. Of course, uh, there's good old food thermometer, which, you know, if you're not doing cooking with food thermometer and food scale, you're not really doing science. So uh, I really like this guy. This is a Javelin instant thermometer and it, uh, you just fold it out and it turns on so that you can quickly make sure you're not gonna give everybody at your dinner party food poisoning from, you know, raw pork or whatever nightmare. Uh, These are really useful, and if you're boiling water, you could just, whoop, stick one of these guys in it, get a direct reading of the temperature. Usually what you do is you boil it, and what temperature does that take water to if you boil water? By definition, water boils at what temperature Celsius? 100 degrees. 100 degrees Celsius. So if you boil it and it's boiling, you know that it's at 100 degrees Celsius and it's too hot to brew coffee with. So usually you let it boil and depending on what kind of container it is, just give it a few minutes. Give it like two or three minutes to cool down a little bit 
not too much, but just enough to cool down to 96. Uh, now, I myself am a madman. I have a digital tea kettle. Yeah. So let me show you my uh, nifty digital tea kettle here. Um, so the way that digital tea kettle works. Oh, hold on. I have to extend. Eh. I have to let out more power cord from it because it's too short to reach with it all wrapped up. Give me one second. This is obviously not Bon Appetit. Anyway, uh, so this is digital tea kettle. Um, I'm going to take it aside here and fill it with water real quick. Uh, but on the kind of settings of the kettle, I don't need an all sorts of differences. Um, I really like digital tea kettle and the version of this would be an electric kettle ready for public, for your uh, gas gas, water, meals, uh, uh, like mac and cheese. already boiling water to the stove uh, and let it go. So uh, with this guy here, right, we just turn it on and then it has a preset temperature on it. Uh, it has a couple default settings. Uh, so you can set it to 60, 80, uh, 85, 88. All of those are like common temperatures for different things. Does anybody know why it would have a 60 degrees Celsius setting? Do you know what you would use that for? Uh, keeping it warm. 60 degrees Celsius. Do you know how about how warm that is? Like 115. Uh, yeah, that's not very warm at all. So that's like would be gross to drink something that's that temperature. That's like water that you're supposed to wash your hands at. Uh, there's actually no temperature limit on washing your hands. You can wash your hands with any temperature water that you find comfortable. Um, the reason why this guy has a 60 degree setting is for uh, yeast for baking. That's about the right temperature to activate yeast without killing it. You wouldn't want to go any hotter than 60 Celsius. Um, uh, but yeah, anyway, so you just turn it on and then I set it to 96 and now I'm gonna let it run. And with the hold option, once it gets to 96, it'll just stay at exactly 96. So now while my uh, kettle is going, I'm gonna move it aside, hopefully without spilling water all over my laptop. Uh, and now I'm going to set up the food scale for the uh, actual brewing of the coffee. So uh, I'm going to place my mug. And um, I, I think it is worth, uh, just so you all know, for your own information, you should totally preheat your mugs. Um, now, I'm not saying in the oven or whatever, uh, but just take it, take your sink, run your sink up to hot, right? Um, and then fill the cup with hot water before you uh, put coffee or any other hot beverage into it. It just makes it so that if you already start with a preheated mug, your warm drink will stay warm longer. Uh, I'm gonna take this, toss it on the food scale, and then I'm also going to add to that my actual uh, pour over cone here. And actually, let me back this camera up a bit. So that it's close. Okay. Uh, and then I'm going to bust out one of my paper filters. Uh, filters come in all different shapes and sizes, oddly enough. Uh, the ones that I like um, are the same brand as all my other coffee gear. It's all Hario. So this is the Hario V60. And usually paper filters come in brown and white. Um, I don't think it matters. Some people like to talk about preferring the brown ones just because they're like all natural and organic. Or if you don't want to use that kind of like logic or rationale, you could always say it's because they're unbleached. Um, but I prefer the brown filters. Anyway, you take it out, right? And it comes out like this. Uh, the stitched edge here, you just take that and fold it over. And then you put it into your cone and you take it and spread it open, right? So now here's my uh, cone with the filter in it. And then you want to take this and you want to rinse it. Uh, why do you think you would want to rinse it? Anybody? That's why you want to rinse your coffee filter before you use it, not just because it's crazy. Mm. Well, it seems like 
dust on it or something. Where is it? Yes. Well, it's like, it's a piece of paper in a bag with other pieces of paper. And I don't know, have you guys ever, like, had a pack of printer paper and you get to the end of it? What's always on the bottom of a pack of printer paper when you're done with the pack? Like, dust bunny. Yeah, I mean, it's all that weird, like, paper dust and lint and stuff. And now the same thing happens inside the bags with these filters, and so you want to rinse it to get all of the dust from the outside of the filter off so that that doesn't end up in your good cup of coffee. Um, anyway, loud noises. I'm going to run the coffee grinder one more time for this hot cup. don't love the look of all of these coffee grounds, so I got kind of broom. <laughs> For cleaning up, it's kind of... Uh, anyway, so like I said before, numbers that are forever burned into my soul because I check them every day when I make coffee. Uh, 32 grams of coffee grounds first. Um, so I'm going to turn on my scale. And the nice thing is that if you turn it on with stuff on it, it'll automatically set it to zero. Change this on over to grams. And uh, add 32 grams of coffee to them. Oh. No, that would be too much. Cooking shows because they edit it. You know that, right? Cooking's not actually that way. Uh, anyway, and my uh, electric kettle over here, uh, I don't know if you can see the number, getting close, getting up to 96. Uh, and like I said, we're going to pour over these uh, 32 grams of coffee, about 500 milliliters of water, which is just enough to fill this cup up. Cup up, it's a half, or, yeah, it's a half um, liter. Uh, when you do it, there is a rhyme and reason to it, uh, like a technique or whatever, a correct way that everybody at every cafe uses. At least if that cafe does pour over coffee, that I'm gonna show y'all. Uh, also, usually after I do this, just cause I don't wanna add 500 to 32, it's nicer if it finishes on a nice even 500, you could just zero it again, which will cause all of this stuff here to be deleted. And so it'll only count the weight that's added after whatever is already on the food scale. Food scales are just so useful. Okay, so our water is finally at temperature. Uh, and so, and again, the thing that you're about to see is a mark of good coffee, because I guarantee you like regular old coffee from the grocery store won't do what this will do. Uh, you want to add a little bit of water just to um, catch up all of the beans to make sure that they all are uh, soaked. And you can see like up on the top, it gets that like light brown color, that like bubbling or whatever. Um, we're gonna <clears throat> let this soak through and then hit it with the rest of the water poured in very slowly. And you always aim in the middle and try and make a small ring and you never want the coffee to rise that much. Like some people fill the cone up or whatever. You don't wanna do that. You wanna keep it as compact as you can while you brew it to make sure that the concentration of like the molecules that you're removing from the beans is as high as possible to produce the richest cup possible. The more intentional and the slower the pour over, the better. Anyway, so like I said, um, moistened all the beans first, and now I'll finish the pour over. Oh, other really dumb thing, you will notice that usually these cones have ridges. You wanna pour in the same direction as the ridges. And uh, if you're doing it right, you get two colors. Notice how the like coffee in the middle, the way that it bubbles up is way lighter than the coffee around the edges. Does this only produce one cup? 
Um, uh, it depends on who you're asking. If you ask Mr. Robinson, I call this one cup. If you ask a doctor medically, this is probably two or three cups of coffee. Okay. Um, but you can set up a pour over to pour as many cups as you'd like. This one that I'm doing right here, I would consider a single serving for myself. Um, however, you could totally use this cone and a bigger carafe down below so that it receives more than one cup of coffee. Um, I'll show you some what I'm talking about. They make special coffee pots that go below pour over cones. Uh, or if you use my big boy over here in the webcam, the Chemex, this guy makes uh, about four or five cups of coffee down below if you put the correct size filter up top. And again, uh, when you want to make more cups of coffee, you just multiply those out. So it's about 30 grams of beans for one person, uh, a little bit more for flavor. So just take the number of people who you're trying to serve, multiply that by 30, and that's how many grams of coffee beans you want. I also know like the camera doesn't really do it, but boy, it smells great. Oh, can't see the scale, huh? About uh, 400 grams, about 100 more grams of water to go here. Oh, the other nice thing about the digital kettle is every time I set it back down on the base, it reheats it a little bit. So that every time I pick it up, it's back to exactly 96 degrees, uh, you know, guaranteeing the most consistent brew possible. And just a reminder, the electric kettle, if you look those up, they're kind of pricey. You could do the exact same thing with a normal tea kettle and uh, one of these food thermometer javelins and a little bit of patience. That is one thing you don't wanna go cheap on though. Definitely, definitely if you're gonna get a food uh, thermometer, get a digital one, man, the analog ones suck. You have to like sit around waiting for the little dial to move and sometimes it uh, doesn't respond quick enough. It's such a luxury to know exactly what the temperature of a piece of food is right when you want to know it. Um, okay, and that is a cup of coffee. Um, and this is also a weird thing that um, uh, I kind of do. I never let the last few drops go in. I don't know if that's for any particular reason or whatever, uh, but you can see here, you know, I fill the cup up right to the top just because I measure the volume of this cup. Make sure you don't overfill your cup, which is a common thing that happens to people using cones for the first time. If you're using an opaque cup or whatever, they'll like not notice they're going over because it's happening down below. Uh, and it'll just like spill over the sides and make a huge mess. Or even worse, if you have a digital food scale, it could like break it if you soak it in water. Um, but yeah, that's a coffee. Um, and Here's what I was talking about if you want to use this to make coffee for more than um, just yourself. Uh, Hario, that same company, or lots of other similar fancy coffee companies, they make these receiving carafes, like this one right here. And this is meant for you to put um, the cone on top of and then pour the coffee into here. And then also these are made to be stove safe. So if you want to reheat your coffee after it's been made, uh, in case it's one of those days, you can do that safely on the stove top. You, you wouldn't want to put the Chemex directly on the stove. It's not really made for it. Um, but yeah, that is a uh, picky, obnoxious, expensive hipster coffee with Mr. Rob. Are there any questions out there that I could answer? Have any of you guys had pour over coffee before from like a cafe? No. Um, if you are not yet drinking black coffee, like if you're still in the phase where you're ordering mixed coffee drinks primarily, uh, if you've never had it, I would highly recommend trying um, pour over. It has a way better flavor than the normal old like big brew batch coffee, just regular 
uh, drip coffee. Uh, just because usually drip coffee machines get too hot. They like boil the water and the boiling of the water is what pushes the water up into the top basket that allows the brewing to happen, which means that by the time it's at the top, the water is already 99, 100 degrees Celsius or in some cases steam. Uh, the main reason why this produces a superior cup is the fact that you are using cooler water than 100. Um, now, of course, it's inconvenient. And if you do pour over using boiling hot water, like if you're doing this using 100 degree water, there's really no point. Uh, but give it a try with good coffee beans. I can guarantee there is a discernible difference. Um, assuming you just don't like fundamentally hate coffee. Um, but yeah, any questions on that stuff? <sighs> Tight. <laughs> Also, I like didn't have coffee this morning because I've been waiting to like give this lesson. Oh uh, boy, it's really late to be having a first cup of coffee. Sacrifice. Oh, also on the topic of food scale, uh, if you're into baking, you should totally get food scale. That's the main place where you want to use it. Uh, but I've been making sourdough. Um, Boy, making sourdough is a wild process. Have you guys seen any of those YouTube videos? There's a bunch of them right now getting popular. Yeah, people are trying to make a starter. Oh yeah, I made starter. Oh yeah, did you did you make your bread yet? I did, yeah. Oh, um, by the powers of, of science, and by the way, just warning, this looks gross, but it's not, it's delicious. Yeah, um, like lumpy, ooh. I made starter. This is starter. It used to be all the way up here because as it like the yeast lives and goes through its life cycle, it like puffs this up all the way to the top and then it expands all the way or it contracts all the way back down to the bottom. Uh, but this is my living uh, sourdough starter that I have. Yeah. From the top, it looked like mayo mixed with milk and pepper. That is what it looks like. The, the, the dark spots aren't any lights of anything though. They're just dislocations from the bubbles. Um, and then I have one sourdough uh, uh, dough that's still rising. I'm going to bake this guy today in a cast iron. Uh, but this guy is pumping up and getting ready to go in the oven. It's going to be delicious. And uh, when I make the sourdough, I make it uh, two uh, batches at a time. So let me show you what one of these looks like baked. Dude, it's my cooking show. This is actually kind of fun. <laughs> wow. Ooh, looks legit. Wow. Yeah, it's it's too good, man. I've been having to run extra so that I don't like let all this bread get me fat, but um yeah, being able to make good bread is a huge come up. We've been having the like sickest avocado toast every day Yum. Um, the oh the other crazy thing we did that's just been like way too opulent because like what else is there to do when you're stuck at home forever than get good at cooking uh we made uh black garlic have you guys seen black garlic oh my god yeah Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we took black garlic and we turned it into a paste and we put it in butter. So we just have like black garlic butter ready to go like in a spreadable form. Um, it's the sickest garlic flavor. It's just like too good. Um, but yeah, anyway, thanks for listening to my piece on coffee. I'm sorry that I couldn't also let you guys sample all of my wares because I, I argue it's like a life-changing experience. There's like, if it's going to be a thing you do it every day anyway as part of academia, uh, you might as well save a bunch of money by doing it yourself. Uh, and you might as well have a good time. Like those cord pods break my heart, man. Not only is it a bunch of waste, but also it's just not that good of a cup of coffee. It, it does the job. It's fine if I'm desperate. It's fine if I'm like at an Airbnb and that's all we have. Um, but, you know, when possible, when at home, perfect coffee every time. Um, if you want like links or references or purchasing advice on like your own gear, hit me up. Uh, normally I make this offer that um, if you're willing to wait, I can get you this stuff for free. 
because it always shows up at Goodwills, man. Like, it, I, I can't make that promise now because I don't know how long it's going to be until all the Goodwills are reopened. But I've been able to set up two homies with Chemexes. You see Chemex at Goodwill a whole bunch. People are like, I'm going to make fancy coffee. And then they never do. You can find these at Goodwill if you wait. You can also find those cones for less than a buck each if you wait. I've even seen this kettle before at a Goodwill, but not the digital version, the uh, uh, analog version, the one that sits on the stove top. Just one of these gooseneck kettles because it makes it easier to pour. Um, but yeah, man, if, you, if you're willing to wait, you could probably pick it up at Goodwill once all the Goodwills are open again. Um, but yeah, if y'all ever, if you ever have any questions on uh, coffee, coffee gear, or like moving to college equipment, let me know. Uh, anyway, uh, that's it for today. Uh, when I see you tomorrow, we'll talk a little bit about mechanical waves. We'll just do vocab and I'll show you guys a couple cool videos and resources in case you want to know more. I just want to make sure that uh, you see that stuff at least once before next year. Uh, you all have a lovely afternoon, and I will see you on Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you. I have a quick question that doesn't have to do with, like, coffee or physics or anything. Uh -huh. So, you know how Amazon has the Alexa, like, Alexa and Alexa Dot, or those, the Echo? They uh -huh. have this one that's called the Echo Input. It's basically, like, it's no speaker. It's just, you can plug it into any speaker, and it gives it that functionality oh do you, you know? can do that you can do that with the regular alexa um we have a we have an alexa we just retired it because we got the bose version of that and it's just like a better speaker but the normal alexa cylinder at the bottom there's a headphone jack and if you plug it into that it'll send whatever audio was going to come out of the alexa out of the big speakers yeah but um amazon so it makes just this like one it, it's is it the... just that but without its own speaker yeah, pretty much. And you can plug it into any uh, speaker. But I wanted to know if you know if there's a like a Google equivalent to that. So I can plug that into my speaker and not have so, it be its own speaker. Yeah. So, yeah. I, oh, oh, I don't know if any of the Google homes have their own output. Because there the was a Chromecast you... audio, but they discontinued that. Yeah. Also, I don't know why you would even want that. Um, like we unplugged our Alexa and I'm glad that it's put away because it's weird that it's like constantly listening to you and sending your data back to Amazon. The reason why I like the Bose one that we have a lot better is that it's voice activated. Uh, but as of now, it's not connected to the internet. Like if you let it connect to the internet, it'll um, uh, let you do all the voice command stuff with, with Amazon Home and Google Home or whatever. Um, but on the app, I just never gave it the Wi-Fi password. So it's just a voice-activated Bluetooth speaker, but it's not spying on me. It can't because it's not on the internet. Oh, okay. Yeah, you don't, you don't want that stuff in your life, man. It's, like, totally worth it to just open your phone and play a thing than to, like, give Jeff Bezos all of your, like, hopes and dreams and fears for free. Um, but, yeah, y'all have a nice day. I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah.